sounds pretty nice, actually. I like that. That's closer to my neighborhood. <laughs> this week at Lug Guitars in San Antonio. Also, I think I was just staring at the microphone for some reason. I don't know why I was doing that way. Sorry, I forgot the answer. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. And this week, we are at Lark Guitars in San Antonio, Texas. Welcome, everybody. And this week's episode is probably one of the most informative we've ever had. We get to meet with Johnny Larkin, the founder of Lark Guitars, and with Clint Franzen, who is the GM at, uh, at Lark Guitars, and probably one of the most knowledgeable people I have ever met. So check this out. So anyways, you are at Lark Guitars in San Antonio, Texas. My name is Clint Franzen. I'm general manager here. And well, I get to have a lot of fun. <laughs> Basically, what we specialize here is mostly is, is, is custom high-end stores. So, uh, about eighty to ninety percent of what you see is, you know, one-off guitars spec just for here. Um, now, I mean, like a brand like Tom Anderson, you'll see every one of their, their guitars is custom spec. So you might see, you know, somebody else might see this one. Oh, and I want to build one like it, and then they'll do it, but. They don't have guitars that are on the actual shelf. They're like, oh, here's, I want this tally, and you just send it to me. You know, or you know what they would call it, Icon T. You know, so I get to choose each one. I pick the actual woods, the colors, what pickups go in it. So I could do a tele style body. If I wanted two humbuckers in it, I could do that. If I wanted just a single coil and a neck, I could do that too. I don't know why I'd want to be almost <laughs> unsellable, you but you could, you know, we could have fun. If you wanted to trim along on it, like this guy up here that's got the maple top, which is a top T, you know, which you've got a Nashville set up is, you know, three single coils and it's got a, um, a, a tremolo bridge on it, which is not usually very common on a Telecaster style guitar. It's also hollow. So, you know, it's got contours. So you could do pretty much anything you want. Colors, candies, flavors. You know, and they do, you know, aged finishes too. And some of these, they do taste good whenever you eat them. <laughs> We're a Fender Master Grade dealer. So this is basically all custom shop guitars here, besides the two on the end that have the American badges on them. But, um, so these are all basically custom spec guitars to replicate either a vintage style guitar to a T or more like, okay, we want a vintage style, but with modern amenities, you know, playability, tuning stability, and maybe some silent, you know, um, single coils, quite so for the not, right? It's kind of like having a 63 split window Corvette, but you got, you know, a brand new LS3 in there, you know, rack and paint steering, <laughs> air conditioning. You got the cool vintage vibe, yeah. but you got all the modern amenities. There you go. So, yeah. Not a bad way to go sometimes. I got a question on these. Do they, when you get them custom made, do they ask? to have that wear already well, yeah like so 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 there's different levels right so these particular tellies wherever but right here are a 52 black guard which is a spec that you can only get at our shop so like this is one this is one this is one here and this guy here this is no exclusive caster, yeah what? like yeah exclusive his particular oh, spec if they had the choice of what they had in 52 or this guy they would all be picking this one because it's better <laughs> but anyways yeah but so like whenever it comes down to the actual finish on these whenever it's relicking you know, yes, you can spe you, you, you specify, you know, this would be a heavy relic. And there's also differences in the actual finish itself. You know, uh, this is a sh uh, straight lacquer coat, right? Where, like, another exclusive here is, this is uh, a flash coat lacquer, which you can see it's a, it's different. The actual texture, is, it looks a little bit different than the, the actual sheen. This is supposedly the thinnest uh, finish that Fender's ever done. You know, but it has a little bit different look. Now, whenever they first started doing this in, in the custom shop in the late 1980s, and you would think about like, okay, well, me personally, I thought it was, well, this is kind of stupid, right? <laughs> it's like, you know, who's gonna pay for a guitar that's relic whenever you could do that yourself? Well, 
I mean, they're buying torn jeans, too. It, well, so. I mean, exactly, <laughs> right? It's, but, you know, and, and they are kind of comfortable because we all know that, hey, your favorite belt or your favorite jeans are not brand new, right? Right, yeah. So, but this has means a whole lot more outside of, hey, man, it gives you that kind of worn-in look. You know, but also changes, the most important thing is, is it changes the way that, that the guitar sounds. It affects the sound a lot. Okay. Of course, the feel, too, because a lot of times they'll take a neck and they'll do a little bit of shaving on there because a the gloss coat on the neck is just like gummy bear and everything. Yeah, it makes it way easier to slide. Yeah. <laughs> but you think about, you know, when, when they started looking at, whenever the vintage market kind of really came out, late 80s, and I'm not by any means a vintage connoisseur or stuff like that, but I know a little bit about it. But that came out, they were all looking at these old guitars being Les Pauls or, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the Fender camp. So well, how come these older ones sound better, mm -hmm. right? And well, in terms of like a nitro finish, once you spray a nitro finish, it never cures, right? And back in the 50s and 60s, Fender was just spraying that stuff on, it was thick. And so as the years go by, and we're talking over forever, right? If nitro cures, and it shrinks and it shrinks and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner and thinner. Yeah. That's why you'd see some old vintage pick guards that these are made out out of nitro that they're shrunk and they're starting to crack and how come the screw holes are you know bigger is because over time the pick guard started shrinking and then you would look at these old guitars you'd be like man these guys didn't take care of their guitars and you know they were just they were animals <laughs> just throwing <laughs> them everywhere yeah, on tour yeah, but, <laughs> but that wasn't the, the case because as it got thinner and thinner and thinner like some guys were kind of rough with it but literally on some of these guitars you could go up with just your fingernail and just flick the paint right off. And historically speaking, like uh, this Jimi Hendrix Strat here is a, a historic spec um, Strat was a 25 inch scale length. Bam, that's the scale length from there to there. And the radius is actually has to, has to do with the fretboard of the guitar, how curved it is. So the larger the actual number, the flatter it is because it means it's a, it's it's how much it takes to be a diameter of an actual circle. Okay. So a one degree radius is going to be a one inch degree. It means it's going to be so curved it only takes one inch to make a circle. You know, whenever you <laughs> whenever you get around, it. so it's going to be a lot. So yeah, that'd seven. Be a ton, so so man. so so this is a seven and a quarter inch radius. So it's going to take a seven and a quarter inch circle to make the actual full circle. In terms of the theory behind that is whenever you're playing chords, it makes it easier because your hand is naturally curved as it goes down. You can see that my thumb, right? Yeah. And my finger there. So, but whenever you went to bend a string, it's pretty good, but it would, it, would, it would fret out, you know, or you would have to have super high action to get it to where it wouldn't. You would go to bend a note and then it would die because mm -hmm. it was so much, you know, curvature on that particular board. But, you know, I see a lot of times customers get, you know, confused with the radius, thinking like, oh, if the radius is X, whatever, then this means that the neck is gonna be good for me. That's not necessarily true, because the whole neck comes into play together as one. Mm -hmm. So you can have a neck that's, uh, say, <laughs> if, we, if we had the same exact back contour of, of a neck thickness, you know, all all of that. Mm -hmm. And we put a compound radius board on one, we put a um, seven and a quarter on, you know, another, and then we put a flat 16 radius on another one. And they all had the same nut width on them. Most of what you would get is gonna play is if they had the flat, super flat radius on there, all, all of a sudden guys would be like, well, wait, wait, number one, this neck feels wider. And and if in the and the and the whole neck feels smaller and flatter on, on on top and on the actual back. And then if you had the seven and a quarter, like, well, this neck feels bigger. It's a little bit more narrow in the actual nut spacing. And it, because the whole roundness of a neck now comes in to play. Maybe you have a super flat radius. It's you know flat on top. So it's going to make it feel wider, but even though Makes it's sense, not. Yeah. <laughs> You know, it's, okay. it's that it's that illusion thing. Anyways, that was a lot of talking. There, so. <laughs> yeah, so that's my Fender stuff. Um, you know, and, and we do like you know, there's another 64. Like this is like a 59, you know, bass, and like that's a cool one. That's a that, that was a limit which I was showing you, which is uh, the Jimi Hendrix yeah, uh, yeah. Woodstock guitar, Isabella, and there was like a hundred of those made. 
I think for the states, 250 worldwide uh, for the 50 year anniversary. Okay. Duesenberg, um, which is a German made. Bigger rock stars going like, like this, a Joe Walsh model. Mike Campbell from uh, Tom Petty. They kind of have a kind of cool blend of like Gretsch meets Gibson. You know, and they have cool names, like, you know, cool California names, like Paloma. And Made in Germany, named after California. Yeah, you know, exactly, <laughs> some of them, yeah. You know, I, of course, these will always have a special place in my heart because they're from Texas, just like me. Uh, Collins, <laughs> they're uh, made in um, Austin. And these are all custom, hand done. Each one is ordered, you know, to build as well. You know, they're just not, you know. Hey, I, I need a, an I-35. They're like, okay, we'll send one right over. These take <laughs> a year to get. Is that really called my 35? Yep. Yeah, so I 35, you know, which is, you know, I mean, that these are uh, 290s. I will say this automatically right now is the only I 35 I like. That is it. <laughs> yeah, no. Take it. <laughs> I 35, any of the time, is not my favorite at all. Yeah, but this, this yeah. is what i make an exception. Yeah. They, and they do um, electrics, and they also, but they're, but they're more famous for their flat tops, which are their acoustics, which we'll get over there. I uh, know. Some of my favorites right here is uh, Nick Huber, another German made. These are probably, it's, again, it's a subjective thing whenever somebody says, this is the best, because really it comes down to what is everyone's, you know, opinion. You get 10 different opinions of what they think the best is, because A, it depends on what kind of player there are. This guy could be a metal guy. This guy could be a country guy. This guy could be a blues guy. So, you know, and you get them in the same room, some of them might agree, some of them might punch each other. I don't know. <laughs> but it it is pretty easy to say, you know, that he is in the top custom builders on the face of the planet. Um, he builds about 250 guitars a year worldwide. Oh, wow. And he, right now, is the first guy out that has done the first, uh, you know, he got into 3D printing metal bridging. And he has, a, he has a guitar out there, a prototype, which is the first ever 3D uh, printed metal bridge. It's really cool. Super expensive stuff, but it's great. You know, and it's, I mean, his um, attention to detail is absolutely amazing. This is a, a dolphin, which you would think that this guitar would be heavy this guitar weighs it looks like it's heavy yeah well here hold that thing oh wow four and a half pounds well, actually it's more like 4.4 pounds huh. yeah that's way lighter than i expected um sir is um a company that you know john sir uh he started out uh in, in new in manhattan at rudy's and he used to have uh guitar line called Pensa Sir, which he built some guitars for Mark Knopfler back in the um, 80s. Another one's like Affinity for me. I love these, I love these guitars. <laughs> PRS. PRS, yay. yay. Pretty. How are the trips to the PRS Wood Library? Well, they're they're so awesome. What it is. Yeah. What's that? I have no idea what that is, so you should well, explain that to you. <laughs> well, we'll get there. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I get to do really cool things like go to factories and do stuff, design guitars like this and pick woods or like that, which I'll pull that one down really cool, huh? um, in there, which is, you know, I get to go in. So basically how it works in, you know, a wood library sense. In PRS, you have, you know, different levels, you know, it's different tiers. It's just like, you know, you would think of like, BMW got a 100 series, 300 series, a 500 and 700, and you got the M in each of those series. So, right? But then you, they also have like, you know, a Pinto class, you know, which they don't even call a BMW <laughs> brand. But, but a lot of, you know, guitars now have, you know, their, their cross C stuff, then they get into their American. In terms of tops, everyone has a different opinion. Like, I think that's ripping. You know, I love that kind of grain in like a flame top. Some people like a more tighter grain. Right, oh, okay. we, and these are both flame tops, right? And some like big, wide, open flame. You know, let's see if we got like this is more of like a bigger, open flame to it. Now, when, whenever you talk about a wood library, since I'm a signature dealer, if you're a signature, and there's 30 of us out there in the United States, well, that gives pretty, us pretty limited. Uh, yeah, deal um, cool. And then that gives us the um, opportunity to go in and we do private runs 
you know, what reports called wood library. So which gives me the option to go in there and hand pick some really nice woods, further color uh, options, plus a few design change options that, that, that a regular customer, that, or that I couldn't do if you just wanted, I want a custom 24. And that's because I order them in more quantities, right? So I do more of a run, kind of like how I was doing my Fender Custom Shop stuff, right? Our latest run of what uh, we did, we did two of them. So we did a custom 24, and we did uh, uh, a little bit different designs on these. So the bodies are what they would call a fat back, which the thickness is actually here. So if you look, it's really hard to see. We're talking maybe a, a quarter of a actual inch. But if we were to take this guitar, and we were to take this one, and if you look at that jack, and you look at where the jack kind of comes up to where the binding is, you can see that the body on the on my left would be a little bit deeper. Yeah, you can definitely see the thickness difference. So, and what that does is it is it extends the um, lower end range of the actual guitar. Huh. Right, so it gives you a little bit different sound. Now it's not going to be like full, you know, single cut depth or McCarty depth. You can see like that's much deeper, Jeez, right? Yeah. Big difference on that one. Yeah. So, um, so is that body depth? Is that really what gives you that low end? It is can. That? It can extend, but of course, also that also is coupled in what kind of wood choices that you actually use too, and also the construction of the guitar as well. So PRSs, most of them are going to be a glued neck joint. Or, you know, mm -hmm. you have a bolt-on neck, which is like this guy here, okay. a glued neck joint, set neck, and then you have a neck through where it's all one piece, all you know, going yeah. through, right? And there used to be an argument in between on which was more efficient, you know, and this and that, you know, and like it used to be like, oh, a bolt-on neck was the least efficient, you know, version, okay. you know, to transference. And that's, it is true, I mean, back as, you know, you think of in the... 50s and 60s whenever they were building. It also depends on who's building the actual guitar because <laughs> you'd have, you know, a lot of neck movement and it wasn't a tight pocket. Mm -hmm. So, which would not transfer as much energy through there. So, of course, yeah, then you glue a neck joint in there. Yeah, it was much better, but a neck through was always the best. Yeah. Now, construction has come so far, especially, you know, on um, neck uh, construction. I mean, if we were just to talk about that real quick in terms of a bolt-on, if you don't show the headstocks, these are two stratty bodies, right? This is a real strat, right? This is a kind of a clone of a strat, right? Two different brands. This is, you know, a four bolt neck joint right there, you know, vintage correct. And, you know, you got that big heel and all of that, right? Now look at this neck joint. Two bolts. Look at that. And if you look at the actual, look how the neck is cut from the bottom. It's kind of, it's kind of like a triangle. See that? Yeah. Where this one's just flat, right? Yeah, so this is called the, um, this is a Tom Anderson, and he calls this joint a um, wedgie joint, right? You know, which I'm pretty sure we all either have received one of those or given one to somebody in our <laughs> lifetime. But anyways, so his thing about this is, is this neck joint is so tight, it's never going to move on you. And literally, this guitar could pass inspection with the neck on there, strung up and played without the bolts being in it. Without the bolts. So, yeah, it's how tight. Wow. So it's it, it's a design where it's actually as transferent and as resonant as a glued in neck joint. But you still have the, um, you know, um, ability if you ever had to snap your actual neck, you could replace it. So back to the wood library stuff. So in terms of what, what you get in, um, in your different wood combinations and how that affects your actual tone. So like in, in this run, I did, I did a couple of different versions. So this is a quilt top, right? Or, and this is a flame, or what, what they call it is curly, or you can, you know, sometimes be called like uh, flame maple or tiger stripe maple, right? Pretty easy. Any one of these, like this is one, and this is one here that has the quilt top on it. It's going to have a maple neck on it with a ebony board, but it's going to have a Karina body. And here you can see it, you know, natural Karina, or white limba is its real name. So with this, so like a, a stock PRS custom 24 comes with a uh, mahogany body, 
maple top, mahogany neck, right? And we're in a rosewood board. Mm -hmm. So the difference, you know, Karina is close to um, tonally as uh, mahogany, but it's got a little bit sweeter mid-range to it. Couple that with a extended body, it's only going to extend those, you know, frequencies a little bit more and give you more of it. Yeah, is Karina hard to find? Is that a more rare wood, or is it just? It's it. It is really the thing about Karina is it's dangerous to work with. It can kill you. You know, if you breathe it in wrong and stuff. This is another wood library with a different model, but you can tell this is a mahogany, and that's a natural body, and you can see the difference there. The stained maple neck there. It's a pretty Man, guitar. That looks, yeah, that neck is amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a special man, a special 22, which I kind of, you know, um, jokingly call this the poor man's John Mayer, you know, special evil, <laughs> whatever, you know, which gives you that kind of ilk, but not at $17,000. Yeah. And this has got a Hiricoti board, which has got great movement to it. Hiricoti, Z-I-R-I-C-O-T-E, which is a um, Mexican rosewood. So this really kind of gained um, popularity, especially in the great, you know, rosewood, you know, scare, you know, if, you know, pieties that, that, that happened a couple years ago, which is now no longer around, where you couldn't import or export rosewood things and you know so they guitar makers had to start finding other ways that hey we can export these kind of woods all right so this is a private stock a, a good example of it and we're going to kill a couple of birds with one stone here so i was telling you about how cool my job is this is a design that was done by me so basically i get to go and raid their um their uh, wood locker right and i get to dig through all, the, all these woods and i found this piece of wood so i was telling you over there like the difference in between like quilt and flame and there's other kinds of wood like this is this is spalt maple right here spalting right and there's some flame in there so this part of the actual wood is diseased right here with the actual spalting side and usually it's really hard to make guitars with this because it can just flake away like they can start carving into the actual top and it just disintegrates right and they're like okay it's done um but what was cool about this is it had this it was kind of disease sinking in t t to this wood. And I asked him, hey, could you max this off and just stain the flame top and leave the other natural? And then we took a flame maple board and we took that stain up there all the way up it. And this is spalt maple bird inlays, which is very sexy. <laughs> and then, you know, a roasted flame maple neck I mean that's just again crushing neck yeah that's, yeah, that's a nice guitar yeah it's got a nice price tag too but um, <laughs> that's you know I mean that's part of the deal I and mean, what's cool about this is it's got lumen lay side dots so if we, if we were to turn off the actual lights this would glow in the dark so on a stage it's cool but it's also this is a cool thing about this is this is a kind of a more radical t t design for PRS one of the first ones, if not the only ones, without pickup rings. It took me a while to convince them not to put pickup rings on this, because why would you want to cover up this pretty top? Usually they have, you know, rings on them. Um, but this also has a compound radius fretboard, which is a non-common PRS thing. So, and this color is called Sandstorm Fade. Sandstorm. Did you pick the name for it too? No, that's, that's just a, a cool color. <laughs> so like this, famous for um, yeah. on Van Halen 2, you know, album, which this guitar, um, not this one, but this the famous one is Buried with Dimebag Daryl. So this was a run that they did last year to um, for, for the 40 year anniversary of Van Halen 2. And this is uh, the Bumblebee, which is my favorite one of his. And this is the prototype not a uh, non-fine tuner Floyd Rose and you know with the locking nut which at the time was stable first super stable you know whammy aerobatic bridge out there everyone thinks that Eddie doesn't use a tone knob it's right there <laughs> just hidden all right so what's cool about this guy is this is another one of the guitars that Eddie just built himself I mean it probably cost him 75 bucks to make this guitar it's a twenty thousand dollar guitar right yeah, yeah but this is relic exactly how it is um, you know, period, correct stuff, signed by Eddie. 
50 of these made world, worldwide. And these are actually picks from 1979, and these are real tortoise shell that they, you know, um, which is illegal, but they, you know, they didn't harvest these. These are from that time. <laughs> yeah, like, like, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, these, you know, if you were making these, then yeah. That right, would be yeah. One like, ah, I don't need those. Okay. So, but yeah, this is really cool, and literally, you plug this guitar in, you sound like Eddie. It's cool. So, where did, so you had a question? What's the, yeah, is that just tape holding on? What's the, what is the holder there for the picks? Oh, this, yeah, so that's just double-sided tape. He just took double-sided tape, slapped it on there. Actually, it's, oh, it's, it's not even double-sided double tape. tape. It's If you come here close, it's just duct tape rolled up. It's even <laughs> it's even less, you know, less cooler than that. But, that's you know, great. So what he did, it just made it you make it work. At the end of the month, John, John and I are going to arm wrestle on who gets to keep this. <laughs> All right, man, so right here we got the 79 Bumblebee, Eddie Van Halen, 50 made. Um, all right, so if, I mean, if you wanted to sound like Eddie, this is it. You buy this, this right here. All the licks are built into it. It is. <laughs> I didn't know what it was doing, but yeah. <laughs> you gonna play a little bit of one of the new songs? No, no. Just I still got like a month before it's out. Just huh? a lick. You don't have to put it in, just so you have it. My question is if just from that riff, when the song does come out, if YouTube's gonna flag my own music and be like, hey, you're playing someone else's stuff. <laughs> Which has totally happened oh, that's before. Such a drag. It has happened before.